Hawaiian eruptions generally invoke images of glowing fountains spraying lava up into the air. Molten rock from fountains falls back to the ground to feed large open rivers of lava, mostly a'a, that can travel 5 to 10 miles down the volcano in a day. The 1955 and 1960 eruptions are good examples of this. Both erupted directly from vents in Lower Puna and produced high fountains that fed fast-moving a'a flows. The 1960 eruption was particularly big, and its lava flows eventually overtopped barriers built to protect the town of Kapoho. Both of these eruptions were short-lived, lasting only a few weeks. In contrast, eruptions that persist for many years, like the one we face now, erupt nearly continuously with little fountaining. Less lava is erupted per day, so the flows are smaller, though they end up covering more land in the long term. These flows are dominantly pohoihoi lava that forms lava tubes. Tube-fed flows are well insulated and can travel long distances. Generally, pahoihoi flows will be slow moving on the gentle slopes found in Lower Puna. Pahoihoi creeps forward 100 to 1,000 yards in a day, but can move faster on locally steeper slopes. The devastating lava flows that inundated Kalapana in 1990 were slow moving pahoihoi similar to the flows that are threatening Pahoa and Lower Puna today. The flows in 1990 crept slowly over Kalapana for over six months, burying much of the town under 60 feet of lava. Civil Defense Director Harry Kim described it as a glacier of lava. The behavior of slow-moving pohoihoi flows on Kilauea can be notoriously difficult to predict over time. Flows often appear to move in fits and starts, guided by small changes in the ground slope and local barriers only a few feet high. On flat ground, they can appear inactive for hours as they inflate or thicken. Variations in the amount of lava reaching the front of the flow can be caused by changes in the volcano's output or blockages in the lava tube system. Both can cause flows to pause, creating false hopes that the flow has ended. Over time periods of weeks to months, lava tubes branch, allowing flows to spread out and cover larger swaths of ground. Older flows may deflect younger flows, making it increasingly difficult to predict the flow paths. Over months or years, the flows will engulf almost everything in their way. When lava first approaches your neighborhood or property, it is natural to wonder how it will behave as it gets closer. During the first few hours, pohoihoi flow fronts usually don't look very impressive or threatening. Most pahoihoi flows travel very slowly, only a few hundred yards a day. The fronts of advancing pahoihoi lava flows are low, generally less than a foot high. Small outbreaks of lava called toes ooze out from the front, but then merge together to form larger lobes of lava. On gentle slopes, a crust rapidly forms on the slow-moving pahoihoi. This sped-up video shows how the surface of a lava lobe cools quickly and a flexible glass crust forms as the flow slows. Soon the flow begins to rise or inflate like a balloon, filling with newly arrived lava. 
Here a Pohoihoi flow creeps forward as multiple lava toes that continuously break out and crust over. As the flow advances, the toes combine, allowing the flow to spread out and cover more ground. This flow is advancing as a series of long, thin fingers, which merge and inflate together to form a single level sheet of lava. Notice that while the lava flow moves forward and also inflates upward, the crust remains frozen in place. As a lava flow inflates, the stiff outer crust must crack to accommodate the newly arrived lava, which may ooze or gush out from the cracks. Combinations of inflation and locally steeper slopes can produce larger lobes of lava ranging from 5 to 10 feet wide and extending 10 to 100 feet from the front. Here a pohoihoi flow is filling in a depression. Incoming lava trapped beneath the crust is causing the entire surface to inflate together. Eventually this flow will create a small hill. Inflation changes low spots to high spots and gullies to ridges. Pahoihoi flows are affected by barriers as well. Here an advancing flow hits a four to five foot high older flow. The new flow inflates rapidly and ends up being several feet higher than the original ridge, turning high ground into low ground. These flows are surrounding older high ground and preserving it as a kipuka, at least until the next flow comes along. This changing of the ground surface is another reason it's so difficult to forecast flow movement over time. Lava flows are initially narrow and relatively thin. The lava may pass through your neighborhood and only damage a few properties. However, as days or weeks pass, the flow will spread sideways and thicken threatening nearby structures that may have been missed by the original flow front. The fronts of Pohoihoi flows are temporarily diverted by objects and structures such as stone walls, but continued inflation will eventually cause them to be overwhelmed and covered. Over the course of several days to weeks, Pohoihoi flows may inflate to thicknesses of 10 to 20 feet. Loose metal objects such as cars, propane tanks, and metal roofing may become embedded in the crust and are lifted by the inflating flow. This series of photos shows how lava flows buried Walter's store in Kalapana over seven weeks. Only the sign remained standing above the lava surface, though this too was eventually covered. As Pohoihoi flows inflate, they also cool from their top and sides, creating a lava tube. This process generally takes a week or two, but can happen much faster. Skylights, collapsed windows in the roof of a lava tube, allow scientists to measure the width of the underground stream and the speed of the lava flowing in it. This helps them estimate how much lava is feeding the flows. Kalapana taught us that the entire length of Pohoihoi flows must be considered active, no matter how dead they appear. Pressure within the flow can fracture the crust at the margins at any time, creating a new flow lobe and causing problems to properties that may have been spared by the original passage of the flow front.
Breakouts from inflated flows can be quite large and move quickly due to excess lava stored within the flow. These breakouts happen with little warning. Their speed and size can easily catch people unaware. Though quite rare, much larger surges can be caused by lava accumulating behind blockages in the tubes or rapid increases in supply of lava from Pu'u'o'o. Extremely high pressure can cause the tube to burst, releasing large volumes of stored lava. Here a channelized flow enters the ocean after covering a thousand yards in less than two hours. The ensuing flows can move many times faster than normal flows, covering distances in one or two hours that would normally take days. Pohoihoi flows may be extremely complex and consist of multiple fronts. Broad flows like this present a much greater hazard than narrow flows. This is an animation of infrared NASA images of a Pohoihoi flow over two weeks. Breakouts occur along the whole flow, not just at the front, and some generate new flow lobes. This is one way flows widen over time. Breakouts obviously cause serious problems well back from the front for people who might have assumed the danger has passed. On a time scale of weeks to months, the flow front will appear to stop and restart on an irregular schedule. Pauses, or temporary drops in the amount of lava feeding the lava flows, have been very common during this eruption since 1990 and are still occurring. When this happens, the advance of a lava flow may slow or stop altogether. While this may seem like a good thing at the time, when the supply of lava to the flow is restored, lava can break out and surge forward from anywhere along the lava tube system. Because the old flows have inflated, they form barriers to new breakouts, diverting lava into areas that were previously spared. This is what happened at Kalapana. Over two months, multiple pauses forced each new flow to spread over a different path, covering a wider and wider area and eventually engulfing the town. During the past 30 plus years, approximately 50 square miles of land in Pune has been covered by lava flows. This is nearly 10% of the surface of Kilauea. The volcano is still growing, constantly covering itself with new layers of lava. In the past thousand years, Kilauea has been almost completely repaved and will probably be covered again in the next thousand years. It's important to remember that this is all a continuation of a natural process that has been occurring longer than people have walked on this earth. Ultimately, anything we build on Kilauea will be consumed by the volcano. If we want to live here, we must be adaptable.